good Tuesday morning on the Cross Border Interview Podcast. My name is Christopher Brown, your host, and we are back uh, talking transgendered in Alberta. Uh, yesterday's interview with, um, I, I already, I, uh, I need to cut right now because I forget their name. I, I need to, I, and I need to, because it was a really good interview. Anna, I was going to say Anna me, but it's not Anna. Okay. I'm going to say this again. Welcome back to another Tuesday edition of the Cross Border Interview Podcast. This is our second episode in Transgendered in Alberta. Yesterday's episode with Anna Murphy was amazing, and we want to continue this conversation. And today we are sitting down with Zeke Koi. Uh, Koi is right. I apologize. Koi. Um, Zeke, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Sure. Yeah, I'm so happy to be here. Um, I, I said this during my interview with Anna, and I'm going to say this with my, to start every episode this week. Um, I'm probably going to put my foot in the mouth because I'm learning. I'm, edu- I'm trying to educate myself and I'm trying to give platform, my platform to people who don't have sometimes a voice and they need to be, have a voice. So, um, Zeke, the question that I'm going to start with is when did you know there was something different um I kind of knew for like since I was a child since I had any realization that I was a human being (laughs) I think like consciousness you know um I always knew that there was something off but I really didn't have the right vocabulary to describe what it was especially growing up in a very fundamentalist Christian household (laughs) So are you originally from Calgary or were you from or, or rural Alberta or where were you originally from before moving or following, making a house here in Calgary? I am originally from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and then my folks moved here when I was about two. So I've been here most of my life, but my I have a lot of ties to kind of like the self. <laughs> so. Growing up in a, as you said, a religious household, it must have been hard to be a person identifying with their insides compared to their outsides. As a transgender person, it must have been hard. Take me through the the, the journey that is Zeke Koi. Well, <laughs> um, I would say. So is it, is it all right for me to like talk a little bit about mental health and like- You can, you can talk. This is your time to talk about whatever okay, cool. you wish, because this is, this is the great thing. You are going to lead this conversation. I'm going to ask the questions that I think my guests or my, uh, my listeners want to ask, but you, you, if you want to talk about mental health, let's talk about mental health. If you want to talk cool. about the weather, let's talk about the weather. So let's oh, talk great. about Good. whatever you want to talk about. Awesome. Um, so when I was in the ninth grade, I was still presenting as female at this point. I hadn't started my transition. Um, this was probably, oh my goodness, this was like 2016 at this point. Oh my God, I feel so old now. But this was, so grade nine, I was going through a lot of um, mental health difficulties, especially living at home um, with my folks. They were not particularly open to the idea of me seeking treatment or seeking any kind of help. Um, So the way that I ended up going to the hospital the first time was a little bit scary for everybody. Um, So I ended up in the psych ward for the first time for a couple weeks. It was only two weeks. Um, And that was kind of the, I guess, the catalyst of my transition because I was finally out of this bubble almost of Christianity and of my house, my family. So I was able to branch out and start living my life around my peers. And once I started doing that, I started listening to other people's points of view. And I had come out of hospital and I was back at home and I was really butting heads a lot with my mom. And I wasn't really sure why, because Well, it was for a few reasons because I had then come out about my sexuality. So I come out as bisexual um, and she was relatively accepting of that, but still not completely on board. Like she didn't like the fact that I would bring girls around. She didn't like that I was dating women in the first place. Um, 
So she was very much against that, but um, still like kept me in the house, you know, was very like part of my life. So we, had, we were having some troubles at home and then I went to the hospital for the second time and I ended up staying a lot longer. I was staying there for, I think six weeks and, or it was eight weeks. So I met my first, my first transgender friend um, and I won't disclose his name because I haven't gotten his consent, but this person um, ended up being a very influential part of my life. And we actually, like the first time I met him, I really didn't, I'd never met a trans person before. So I was like, are you a boy or a girl? And he got really upset with me and he was like, I'm a boy. And I was like, oh shit, I'm so sorry. And like, we, you know, we kind of came across from that and, or sorry, came away from that as friends. And I, we started making jokes together and just hanging out. And he really opened my eyes to the whole trans thing. And then once he finally explained to me what gender dysphoria was and all of these feelings that he had been experiencing his whole life, I knew immediately that, that was me. And I was like, oh shit, this is not something that I need to be dealing with right now because I already had like all of these mental health problems and I had, like a housing crisis going on. I was in financial distress. Like all, I had a whole bunch of other life events that were going on during that time that prevented me from starting my transition at that point. Because I was, I was still around probably 13 or 14 in my time, mostly in the psych wards. So I was like in and out of hospitals for a very long time. I, I went to the psych ward a total of eight times over the course of, um, I think it was two or three years. So I've, I've you know, kind of run my way around the block a couple of times, um, but I found what mostly stopped those trips was coming out. And I remember exactly how it happened. I was at, I was at a group home in Calgary called, um, it was just called Eleanor's House. Um, and it's for children who have gone through sexual exploitation problems. So that's where I had ended up at the time because my family was not wanting me in the house um, for a few reasons. Uh, but I was so unhappy at that point with how I was presenting and the way that I looked. And I, I was just so frustrated and I finally realized that I was allowed to cut my hair. So I went to the bathroom and I had a pair of like craft scissors, like basically kitchen scissors. And I weed whacked my entire head. I just like, I went basically from my scalp. I probably had an inch of hair around and it was just a buzz cut, but with no buzz. It was just scissors. And so it like, it was a barber's nightmare pretty much. But um, the leader of the group home eventually saw my head and she was like, why didn't you just ask me to take you to a barber? And so um, we went to the barber for the first time. And I remember like, I, I sat in the chair and I just cried because <laughs> like I, I looked in the mirror and like I had felt the first, sorry, I'm like getting a little emotional because it was like a very, a very heavy experience for me. Um, but I remember when I first like weed whacked my head, I looked in the mirror and I finally saw myself for the first time. And it was like finally meeting myself and being able to like come to terms with that. So then I had gone to the barber and I had already experienced like a little bit of that where it was very much like coming into my skin. But then once everything was like cleaned up and I had like a very traditionally mask haircut, I guess you could say, I like, I just sat there and I bawled. <laughs> I just, I just cried and I cried and the poor hairdresser was like giving me tissue and she was like, okay. I was like, oh, I'm fine. You know, just like having this big moment in this poor lady's chair. Um, but since that point, I, I realized, you know, like I couldn't really stay in the closet anymore. And it was getting, the closet was glass. It was just too hard for me to hide it. And so I remember that night I sent a text to my mom and I said, Hey mom, what's going on? I know we haven't talked in about like three months, but I just want to let you know, I'm a boy. Uh, love you. <laughs> Talk about this later. And uh, I remember the next day she came to my group home and she basically screamed in my face. And she, at that point told me, you know, like you will never ever be a boy. You will always be my daughter. You'll always be my girl. You know, I'll always call you by your dead name. Uh, and it was, it was a really difficult time because I was at a point where I was also like, very mentally ill, going through homelessness, going through drug addiction. So I wasn't really quite in my right mind myself. And I, I remember screaming back at her and 
asking her why she couldn't love me. <laughs> um, so it was a really difficult moment in my life personally, and I know it was for her too, but especially in my transition. So I decided at that point to emancipate myself, basically like not legally, but I, I cut her off um, for the most part. I just stopped talking to her and um, I ended up being in a relationship with a person who was almost four years my senior um, and that ended terribly. <laughs> so I had to move back in with my mother, unfortunately. And then uh, I was living in her place for probably about six months until I couldn't handle it anymore. And COVID hit around that time. So once COVID hit, I ended up moving in with one of my best friends from high school and I started testosterone at that point. So once, cause I was still underage, I was 17 when I like officially left my mom's house for good. I was 15 when I started like fluttering away from her house and going in group homes and whatever. Um, but at the time when I was 17, I went to a doctor here in Calgary, who's very like infamous amongst the trans community. If I call him Dr. J, everyone will know who he is. Um, so I'll just say Dr. J, but I went to Dr. J and um, he deemed me a mature minor, which with medical status means that I am in control of, I was in control of all of my own medical stuff. So my mom had no access to any of my files, to any of my records. So it was there for safe to me safe for me to start hormone therapy so I got onto hormone replacement therapy and I was I like immediately started my voice started deepening pretty quickly um a lot of things started changing really really fast that made me feel a lot better about myself and really made me feel safe in my identity so um it's been about I started testosterone in September of 2020 so it's been a year and a couple months um, since I've started that and I am currently on the wait list for top surgery, but because of COVID, it's been quite delayed. Um, so hopefully in the next two or three years, I'll be able to get top surgery and then I'll be able to start looking at, um, other kinds of surgeries down the line, but the wait lists in Alberta are absolutely ridiculous right now. So who knows? <laughs> I, I, I don't know what you're going through on that part, but I'm waiting for my cancer surgery. So I, I oh know God. that surgery is being held off, so. Um. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. I, I, there's a lot to unpack with what you just said. Yeah, I know that was really heavy. <laughs> it was, but I, I we, we need to have these conversations. Albertans yeah. need to hear these conversations. Canadians, the world needs to hear these conversations. Mm -hmm. I did not know. This is relatively new. Your transition from uh, your dead name to Zeke. You are like you, you. I, I, I. Again, I should. I, I try to never assume anything, but we had talked in for the transgendered week, and you, you seem to have a, a, an amazing head on your shoulder, and then you had just told me this story, and I go, how, how are you still standing? How have you gotten through so much? in such a short little, little period of time. And on top of that, all the while COVID has ravaged this world. Yeah. Like I'm looking right now at you, Zeke, and I'm going like, like, I don't know how I should like give you a round of applause virtually, but <laughs> Jesus, like, and I'm not a religious <laughs> person. How are you still standing? Like what, what is the drive behind you still standing right now? Honestly, I live out of spite. <laughs> and I know that's like a really out of pocket thing to say. Um, but it's also very true. I am a very um, headstrong kind of person. So when somebody tells me that I am unable to do something, the first thing that I'm going to do is do that thing. So, And you're um, going to do it backwards in high heels, right? 
Exactly. I'm going to do it while I'm spinning and dipping, baby. Like, I, you know, I, I love being able to prove people wrong and make people regret what they said. So I think a big part of where my motivation comes from is, is my past and having that self-doubt in me for so many years and from my outside and my family, just everybody kind of telling me you can't do this and you can't be that and this isn't who you are and this is who you're supposed to be it made me so much more stubborn and so much more like just really solid in my identity at this point because I've I've had so much pushback and I've had to fight so hard to get here that it almost in many ways I deal with a lot of crazy situations in my work or in day-to-day -day life nowadays that feel very mundane just based on my teenage years because <laughs> especially like going through psych wards and being in the kind of I would say mentally ill druggy community <laughs> in the early 2010s you know like there's there's a lot of crap there there's a lot of shit there's a lot of gross people there's a lot of gross habits I ended up going through a lot of really gross situations especially with the ex-partner that I mentioned um, at a young age. So I think um, a lot of people have told me I have a little bit of an older mind or I'm very mature for my age, whatever. But I think it's just because of the fact that I had to grow up very fast. Um, and I didn't, I didn't really have a choice in many ways. Like I, I wouldn't be able to be who I am and live in my own apartment and pay my own bills if it wasn't for my motivation. Like I, I remember being 15 and working nearly like 60 hour weeks at my restaurant because I, I wanted the money so badly to move out. And a lot of people had that same experience, but I think like when you have something that's so integral and necessary to you, that just pushes your drive so hard. And that's actually kind of like bit me in the ass for later years, right? Like nowadays I've had to stop myself and my partner has even had to come to me and be like, honey, like you can't be working two or three jobs and you can't be working 80 hour weeks and that kind of thing. Because I, I was pushing myself to that extent and then I start kind of dealing with a lot of mental health symptoms. So it's definitely, it's super important to balance that, especially when you've got certain things that are a part of your life for me, like being transgender and being really mentally ill, being whatever it is that I am, having all these certain things it's so important to constantly keep yourself in check and really be monitoring like how you're doing. And I think like being honest with people is another important step, right? Like when people ask me how I'm doing, I take a second and reflect. I, I know a lot of people are very automatic with that. They're like, oh, I'm fine. I'm great. I'm okay. I'm good. I don't like, I, if I'm good, I'm good. I'll say that. I'll be like, oh yeah, I'm doing great. I'm doing well. How are you? But if, if I'm not doing well, I'll be like, I'm not feeling too great today. I'm feeling shitty. And then sometimes I'll catch people off guard because they're like, oh, why? And then I'll be very, I'll be very open and honest because I think that's one of the most important things that you can do in relationships is being open and honest with people with where you're at and telling them like, if you're, if you're doing well, then that's great. Like be like, hey man, I'm having the most fantastic day today. Fantastic, great, cool. If you're having a shitty day, just being honest and being like, hey man, like whatever happened today and I'm feeling like ass, then I've had like, some of the best advice from random coworkers or just random acquaintances that have said some very powerful and impactful things without realizing it because I've just been honest and vulnerable. And that's, and I feel like that's another thing with especially masculinity is a lot of men are taught not to express our feelings or express or cry or express when something's wrong. And instead, I feel like the expectation is to shove it down and kind of just repress it, repress it, repress it. And I lived my life doing that for many years, like as, as a child, as a teenager. And it led to extreme executive dysfunction, extreme like lack of confidence, lack of self, <laughs> like a lot of just mental health problems and symptoms were coming up due to me shoving down my emotions. And one of the most <laughs> powerful and healing things that I recognized for myself was it is not feminine nor is it weak to be honest about where you're at. And I think that that's <laughs> like a really valuable thing to know is that like, if you're just, if you're being honest about your feelings, <laughs> if you're talking about emotions, that's not inherently feminine. And that's not inherently something to be ashamed of because it's so important. And it's like a lot of people respect 
you when you're when you're open with them and they'll give you that in turn and then you learn more about people and you get deeper bonds like it's there's so much more value in being honest than there is in repressing and just shoving everything down you know <laughs> if there was ever a 30 seconds out of the last three seasons i have done on this show that would be the perfect commercial for this this entire show this podcast this series of youtube things that we're putting together that that quote you just said would be it it is mm -hmm. You need to be honest with yourself. You need to be able to tell your story. And I hope that we tell your story correctly here, Zeke, because I, I, we need to elevate people's voices like yours who have struggled and have come out the other side and are willing to say, you know what? I have struggled. I still am struggling, but I'm going to, I'm determined to fight back and win because that's what we need. So I appreciate your honesty and your candor because I find too often we don't have that enough in our society, even with it being masculinity or even women talking about their feelings because nowadays it seems like we can't talk about our feelings, but we need to. So I yeah. appreciate you being honest here. For sure. I want to I ask the question... Zeke was not born the day you were born. Zeke nope. was born later on. And I apologize. I'm going to say this because I, not to make a joke, but for those who are about to send in uh, rude comments to our website, to our social media, I'm learning. So I might say something here that may not be the most appropriate thing to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. I'm going to ask it anyway, because I'm trying to learn. And if Zeke wants to correct me, but Zeke wasn't born when you were born. Zeke was born on a day that you discovered that name. The name came to you or however the name Zeke was uh, born. Zeke was born that day. The body of Zeke was there all along, but the name Zeke was born on a certain day. Correct. Where did the name Zeke come from? The name Zeke. Um, so my full name is Ezekiel. I, um, I don't really, nobody really calls me that, um, but that is the name that I had chosen for myself. Um, and <laughs> so this might <laughs> sound like a bit strange, <laughs> but I think like for me, one of the most like <laughs> um, euphoric or I guess idealized role models as a male that I could see for myself when I was very early on in my transition was kind of, and I, it was this really vague idea, but I saw almost this like 90s skater guy, right? With like spiky hair, who just like didn't give a fuck, covered in tattoos. And all I could think was like, that guy's name is Zeke. And the name Zeke to me is very, it's a very strong name, but it's also a name that's unique. I haven't met another guy personally named Zeke. Like I know people that are named Zeke out there in the world, <laughs> like some celebrities and yeah. new friends, whatever, but I've never actually met another man named Zeke. And so I was like, if I'm going to pick a name for myself, I need to pick a name that I don't know. So it's like when you're picking baby names, right? You don't realize how many people you hate until you're trying to pick a name for your baby because you're like, oh, I'll pick the name Annabelle. Oh, I hate the name Annabelle. I met, you know, like it's the same kind of concept where you're like, I don't want to pick a name for myself that's like has this terrible reputation. So I went for one that I I had a really good connection to. And if for a while I wanted to go with the name Josh, but I hate the name Josh now. So I'm really glad I didn't go with that. For those Josh <laughs> listeners out there, please continue listening on to yeah, this sorry, show. Josh, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk, I want to ask the question now to follow up that. Transitioning is hard. Yeah. Getting people to to use proper pronouns to use proper names is difficult absolutely and i will be the first to admit that before this interview i asked what are your pronouns because i didn't want to screw this up because i'm trying to do my best here to make sure that i tell your story correctly 100%. talk me through the first time someone used your zeke to identify you because that moment to me probably would have like is Christmas, New Year's, Thanksgiving, Easter all rolled into one for someone who has gone through shit 
and then come out the other side. And then when people start using your name correctly, your pronouns correctly, that must be euphoric, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, I think the very first time it happened, <laughs> it was like, it was that feeling of when a song that you absolutely love comes on and you just get chills through your entire body. And it's like, it, it's just that moment, right? I, I remember, I don't even remember who the person was, but I had come into school and people had just like, I had told somebody and cause I went to a tiny little high school for a little bit of my high school time. I went to Aldi. Um, and there, there's 70 kids at that school. It's teeny tiny. So I told one person, everybody knew by like second period. So somebody had been like, hey, Zeke from down the hallway. And I like turned around. Um, but I remembered that feeling of just like, oh my God, somebody used my name <laughs> instead of like, and it was, it was so just like, uh, yeah, that, that was a really beautiful feeling. And I think like um, going to, a school because I, I went I ended up transferring to Central because I, I dropped out of Ulti to go do drugs <laughs> and then I uh, went back to high school and I went to Central um so while I was there um nobody knew my dead name nobody could call me my dead name because nobody nobody had met me as that so that made it so much easier for me and I remember I felt a lot better at that school just because there were so many people and I was also very introverted. Like I had my headphones on every day of grade 11. I didn't talk to anybody. Nobody knew me. And when I, when I was actually, it's pretty funny. When I was in grade 12, everybody was like, are you new here? Like, are you a freshman? And I was like, no, I was here last year. They're like, oh, okay. <laughs> Cause I was like, so just like to myself. Um, but I think having people that knew me as Zeke and didn't have that connotation of my not my past life but how I used to present and how I used to look really helped because people people treated me as a man people treated me as Z not as the trans person which can be frustrating when you're the trans person because I've been I've been the trans person in a lot of friend circles where it's like oh yeah here's my trans friend Zeke and it's like okay that's quite the freaking introduction man we can just we can just call me Z it doesn't have to be that doesn't have to be an integral part of every single conversation. When it's part of the conversation, I love talking about it. And when people ask me questions, I'm here to answer them. But that being said, there's so much about me that is not related to me being trans that I feel like often gets overshadowed, especially like when people first meet me and like they're under the guise of me being trans, you know? <laughs> As we as we've mentioned beforehand, transitioning from a dead name to your new name, the name that you have chosen, Zeke, is hard. Yes. You've talked about your family. You talked about your mother, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know what your relationship is now after yep. you left the last time. Um, we can talk about that if you're willing, but we can. Does she, does your mother still call you by your dead name? Yeah, she does. Does anyone else still call you by your dead name? Um, I don't let them. <laughs> okay. I don't even let my mother. So let's let's talk about that right now. Sure. Talk to the people who are listening. Talk to the people who have a family member who has transitioned and they don't want to use their, 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 the correct name. They want to continue using that dead name that is, is that dead. What would you say to them? And how does it make a person who has transitioned feel when the dead name still comes up? That is one of the most disrespectful things you can possibly do to a trans person is to call them by the name that they have deemed dead. And I... <laughs> I think that like when, when anybody uses that name for me, it sends a chill down my spine and I get so viscerally angry that I will cut you out of my life. I will not talk to you. you like, I will not be addressed by that name because of the level of resentment that I hold for it because it is a part of me that is no longer relevant to my life. And that is that person who used to exist who 
who was presenting whatever that my mom created that was created before I got here is dead, is gone. And that needs to be established and kept consistent. And the way that I've often described it to my mother, and I think is a really important way to think about it for people that are listening that maybe have a hard time using the correct name and pronouns for a family member or someone that they're close to is that actually puts us as trans people into a lot of danger is if we're in a public space and you're choosing to dead name us or use inappropriate pronouns then we are being put at risk because there are lots of people who are not <laughs> on the same terms and want to hurt us. And I've been followed home by people who know that I'm trans because I've been dead named. I've been like harassed by people who have been given that information. Like it's, it puts us into a really scary situation and it can be very traumatizing. And I understand that for a lot of people, that's not the intention. It's not that you're trying to traumatize your trans friends or they trying to be disrespectful but that's what it comes across as and that's what it is it's extremely disrespectful and I know that from like a lot of people with that perspective it's a it's a uh, an idea of under like not not understanding but still respecting but that's the thing is even if you don't understand you can still use the right pronouns and the right name. It's, you don't have to understand the entire spectrum of gender in order to correctly name and, gen and pronounce somebody. Like that's, that's just how simple it is. And if you don't feel comfortable getting into it with somebody, then you don't have to. Just use the correct name and pronouns. It's that simple. And your relationship with that person will be healed immensely because bringing yourself to that first step will show them that they can start compromising with you. And maybe like, <laughs> being more close in your life, bring more things about their life to you and vice versa. Like it deepens bonds when you're just being respectful. <laughs> um, okay. It's going to ask the big question now and I apologize uh, right, oh, at, right, right out the bat. I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a true Canadian. I apologize for every question I seem to ask today. <laughs> it just seems to be, just this seems to be the way that everything's working for me. <laughs> We live in a conservative province. Yeah. We live in a conservative progressive city, but mm -hmm. it is still conservative. As much as people think that it's not, it's still a conservative city. It's very, yeah. Being a trans person in Calgary, in Alberta, how hard has it been? Very hard. <laughs> Extremely hard. Um, what has been the biggest challenge to overcome i would say a lot of it has been social like just social challenges in general where and by that i mean being out in the world and having people respect me as a person where especially before i started um hrt my voice was quite high it was it sounded like a girl so i would have a really hard time talking to people and um being in public because i would be very masculine presenting and people would name and gender me correctly. And then as soon as I would open my mouth, they'd be like, oh shit, sorry, she. And I'd be like, no, you got her. <laughs> so I think that was one of the hardest parts about it for sure was like having everybody else kind of come around to the same page that I was on. And even then, like, that's not even possible. Like there are a lot of people on the street even that um perceive me as a woman and try to hit on me and then I talk to them and they're like oh shit sorry because they realize I'm a dude <laughs> like it it's kind of happened in that vice versa way now which is great but also you know it's that is one of the hardest challenges is just dealing with people that either don't agree or have some kind of problem with it or feel like they have something to say because I, it's one thing if you don't agree with my, the way that I choose to live my life and you're just choosing to keep that to yourself, I'm sure lots of people have that perspective and that doesn't bother me. What does bother me is when people have a problem with the way I live my life and they feel the need to say something to me about it. Because like I've said um, on the drag episode, I am not impacting anybody else's life yeah. except for my partners <laughs> that's it and my partner is completely fine with the fact that i'm trans so like 
that should have no correlation with what other people have to do with my life, especially like strangers and acquaintances. I'm just vibing, man. <laughs> so you have brought up your partner a few times. Let's yeah. let's t- let's talk about them because you have not mentioned <laughs> if it's a male or a female, and I'm assuming they are listening off screen right now. Yeah, Hello, she's right. Pa- <laughs> uh, I call her my partner. She's my girlfriend. Um, she's a cis woman. <laughs> so your your girlfriend is in the room right now with you as well. So I, I so yeah. so you. Uh, Zeke identifies as a straight male. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm bisexual, but okay. I'm dating right now. Okay, so um, it might, this question might be better asked to your partner, but I'll ask it to you. And if she wants to jump in, she's more than willing to jump in as well. Okay. Um, talk me through dating as a transgendered person. Hmm. Did, did you have, did you, when you started dating your partner, was that something that was the first thing that you had to mention or because I've talked to two other transgendered people and they said that it wasn't the first thing and they got assaulted because of it, because uh, the person that they were dating took offense to the fact that they weren't open. So were you open with your partner when you first started dating her? Yeah. Um, I was very open with her. I, I, I was, um, I think like she also knew me before I started um, hormone therapy so she kind of knew and um, we had dated mutual friends who also knew that I was trans so she kind of she just knew before I had to come out to her um, that being said though I do think that it's important for cis people who are dating trans people to understand or just cis people that are dating anybody in general that if somebody doesn't come out to you about that kind of thing, it's really important to understand where they're coming from before getting angry with them. Because a lot of trans people have to live their lives stealthily and have to be very cautious about who they reveal that information to. So I think like I, that really saddens me to hear that even happen to people that you know, or cause like it happens on the regular, but it's, it's really disheartening just because people's reactions are so visceral and so just so like out of the blue and so angry that it's important to give people grace. We as trans people don't need to be upfront with you. We don't owe you that. We don't owe you anything on the first date. We don't have to tell you crap about ourselves unless we are getting into bed with you. That I think is an important scenario maybe to talk about it, but until that point, like we don't owe you shit. So it's important for y'all to understand that our bodies are our bodies and not any of your business until we deem that necessary. I don't know. I just wanted to put that out there. You know, no, and, I, like, and I appreciate <laughs> that because I, 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 I get again, I'm learning and I'm trying to educate my listeners and my viewers as well when it comes to issues like this, because I, I think there's a stereotype and I could be completely up Creek without a paddle that, um, and yet again, I do not believe this, that I'm just, I'm saying what I believe that there is a stereotype uh, uh, is that if you transition, you should be up front. You should wear it on like as a badge that says, hey, I'm a transgendered woman. I'm a yeah. transgendered man. And I just don't see that. So, and, and this goes back to my assumption because I should, you should never assume anything. When you told me you were trans, trans, transgendered, I was like, what? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I didn't, I like, because I, I don't hey, I have to get into the, And this is, this, this is the part where I'm going to get hate mail. I already know it. And I apologize right now. I don't care. You identify as a male. I'm going to say he, him, I'm going to yeah. call you Zeke because that's what you want to be called. And at the end of the day, that is who you are. The fact that people are in this city that are in this province that are in this country who do not agree with that statement bothers me. And yeah. I, have, I am not in your shoes and I, I do not know what, uh, where you've been and we've tried to allude, uh, uh, tell your story so far in this episode. When you get attacked, when you get things spewed at you from anyone, whether it be family members, whether it be people you don't even know, Do you, and I know you're an introvert, so it's a kind of a weird question, but do you just want to hide sometimes and just say, what is wrong with our fucking society? 
Oh yeah, all the time. I mean, I like, I would say sometimes like I can get borderline agoraphobic <laughs> where like I have such a hard time leaving my house because it's like getting from point A to point B is the difficult part where that little line in the middle of like, I'm safe at home, I'm safe at work, I'm safe at these specific clubs, but getting there or like spending time outside those places or going to the grocery store or going to get new clothes for myself, having to like be an adult and do adult things. That is, it's freaking hard because I don't know if I'm gonna like, I, I could walk out of the house, have a completely normal day, have nobody talk to me, have nobody bring anything up. And then the next day I could walk out of the house and get hate crimes. It, I literally never know which one it's gonna be. And that for a long time, was a big source of anxiety for me. And it still is like there are, especially if I'm like not doing so well on certain weeks, like I will have periods of time where I will go to work and I will come home and that's it. Cause I, that, those are the only places where I really feel safe. So I think like- And that's, that's a sad state of our society when you only feel safe at home or at work. Like it just, it- Yeah. I, I mean, it's also like, that's the reality that a lot of my trans brothers and sisters and siblings live in. Like that's, that's just kind of how it is where we don't, we don't know what's going to happen. We can't figure out what the day is going to bring, especially living in a more conservative environment where you know that the majority of people around you are against you. And that's difficult. But I also think that like, you can choose to live your life living in that kind of oppressed not necessarily oppressed, but like really just hunkered down and beaten up mentality, or you can choose to live despite that. And that's what I like to do is I choose not to pity myself and live in that state of like, oh, everybody hates me anyway. So I'm just not, never going to express myself or say what I have to say or live my life. Instead, it's more like I'm going to live my life just because you don't like me. And I'm just going to see how you like that, you know? <laughs> Calgary, Edmonton, Vegreville, St. Albert, Drumheller, Medicine Hat, Fort McMurray, and Peace River. These are some of the communities this show has been heard in. By advertising with us, your advert will be heard by countless Albertans and Canadians. Visit the link in the show notes to advertise with us today. I, I love your outlook on life. I, like, <laughs> you, like this, this has been such an enlightening conversation because... I, I know we, we we got a little emotional at the, at the beginning, but it is something that needs to happen when you're talking about things that you've gone through. But like, dude, you have a fucking head on your shoulders that I would be like jealous to have. Like you seem to be like, like, I think people need to listen to this episode and take one thing away. Like the screw you, I'm going to do it no matter what, because it makes me happy has to be the new mentality that we live in because if we start thinking that because you uh, you are transgendered, it bothers my life now, is the society we don't need to live on. One hundred percent. My last question to you is this: You have mentioned that you are in the process of waiting for top surgery. Yeah. You, I'm assuming you have talked to other people who have gone through that surgery. Mm-hmm. When that surgery happens, what would that mean to you? <laughs> I, <laughs> the first thing that came to my mind would be, it would be a weight lifted off my chest. <laughs> um, <laughs> Love it. <laughs> for real though. Um, that, I mean, honestly, I feel like that would just be one step closer to feeling like my body is mine and feeling like that moment of cutting my hair that I described where it's like, I can see myself again because with clothes on, I can see myself, but when I'm taking a shower, it's another story because I can see what everybody else can. And I think like (laughs) a really good analogy that I heard for it, it was on some TV show, some like trans character was talking about it and posed it in a way that was like, if you, if some, if somebody, you, had an extra finger or some kind of extra body part, an extra leg, wouldn't she want that taken off or amputated or gone? Like if it's an inconvenience to you in your life, I think that it's only reasonable 
to want that to be taken. And I, I wouldn't describe it as an inconvenience, but that's definitely kind of what it is, is I view that part of my body and certain parts of my body as not supposed to be there and incongruent. So in order to make my body congruent and make everything match and feel the way it's supposed to feel, have like the three lines all kind of mixed up together in the right spots, I think like surgeries have to happen. And some trans people don't have that outlook and that's also completely respectable. Some, some trans people are completely content with their bodies or they can't physically handle having surgery. So I don't think that me wanting to have surgery makes me any more or less valid than any other trans person, regardless of what their plans are. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's something that's very exciting and I hope, I hope happens in 2022. We're gonna see. <laughs> I'm crossing knows? my fingers for you, Zeke. Um, yeah, think- my last question and not to end on a sad note, but I, I've got to ask the question because I've been wanting to ask it. I just, there's been no appropriate time. What's your relationship like with your family today? Um, well, I'll start off with my mom because that's a little bit worse. <laughs> um, <laughs> don't do like the sad shit out of it first. Um, so my mother, unfortunately, we don't really have much of a relationship. And um, I do say unfortunately because I miss her and I hold a lot of respect um, and love in my heart for her still. but. Um, you know, uh, she does not feel the need to respect me. So I don't feel the need to respect her. And that's, that's just kind of how things are right now with her and I, um, so, you know, like, honestly, I've been in a pretty good spot since her and I have not been super close and I'm pretty content with keeping things the way that they are. Um, has any member of your family accepted you? My father has. He's very accepting. Um, unfortunately, he does. He lives in Airdrie, and my my parents have been divorced for quite a long time. So he um has always had partial custody. Like I've seen him on the weekends, and he hasn't been super part of my life until recently. But um, he actually he wants to get into drag with me. Like he is super super supportive about everything, and he was one of the first people. Like even when my mom wouldn't sign off for testosterone, he was going to try to do it. We couldn't end up doing it because it didn't work out. But he was like going to help me do it. So he's he's always been very on my side um, for the whole like transitioning thing, which has been amazing. Uh, no, and I'm assuming in our conversation, you didn't mention any siblings, but no siblings, just yourself. I've got two half brothers, but they're still pretty young, and they live with my dad. So uh, okay, yeah, they're uh, very sweet. Now. So uh, I will leave on. Let's leave on a positive note because, let, let, and I know you talked about your dad, but let's let's leave on a positive note here. Yeah, you have you have gone through a lot. You have mm-hmm. you still have a long way to go. You're still waiting for surgery, but you have learned a lot about yourself. For the kids who are listening, for someone who is listening to this episode right now, and I said this during the drag week, so you know where I'm going to go. What advice would you tell a child who is struggling as you did as a child right now? I think the first and most important thing is that you are loved and you are so worthy of what everything life has to offer you as a human being. And I don't, I think that no matter what anybody else around you says, regardless of whether or not it's your parents, and I'm, you know, maybe I shouldn't be saying don't listen to your parents, but also (laughs) if you have these feelings that are inside yourself and you know that it's related to your gender or your sexuality or whatever's going on in your head, in your heart, know that your instincts are usually right and it's worth exploring or bringing up to whoever you trust, regardless of whether or not it's a parent, a teacher somebody in your life a sibling it's so important to bring that out and express it the best that you can and you know try um one of the things that really helped me was going on youtube or going on any kind of social media platform and finding um other transgender people and listening to what they have to say because sometimes hearing other people's experience can make you feel a lot less alone and i know like mine is just one of hundreds So I think going out and finding a couple of those other hundreds of experiences is such a great way to like broaden your horizons and really see like, you know, if maybe 
a certain way of coming out will work best for you or if like maybe there's some resources that you haven't considered yet but um also like local to calgary there are um skipping stone is a, an amazing resource so i just i wanted to like quickly say that like if there are any um younger trans people who need some resources especially like free or low-income resources skipping stone helped me so much um they got me on hrt within two months of being in their program so they they have saved my life <laughs> i would definitely recommend them as a local resource but make sure to like check in and always be sure to be talking to professionals because being involved in mental health resources and trans resources ultimately helped me <laughs> be this far into my transition and helped me get this far in my life so definitely recommend checking in with some professionals if you feel like you can't handle it on your own. Zeke, I want to thank you so much for this. This has uh, been an honor to help tell your story, but also hopefully educate some listeners on uh, transgendered issues in Alberta. Um, I want to thank you so much for even uh, being vulnerable when you were, but being open and having a candor and an honest conversation between the two of us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I Again, I appreciate using your platform for us LGBTQ plus individuals. I think it's so lovely. And, you know, thank you for having me. I, I really appreciate it. Um, for anyone who wants to, uh, I will link uh, Zeke's Instagram, which is his drag Instagram account in the show notes. Please go check it out. I highly recommend it. Um, Zeke, I want to thank you so much once again for everyone listening. Have yourself an excellent rest of your Tuesday. We will be back Wednesday morning tomorrow with another great episode with another great guest uh, talking about transgendered in Alberta. Uh, Zeke, once again, thank you. Of course. Thank you.